We welcome you to this fourth session of the 1969 Nobel Conference. As is our custom, we will open it with an invocation. Our Father, we thank thee for one another. We pray that in this hour we may be reminded that we are not alone, that we live with our fellows, and that we live with thee. Help us that we may give of ourselves for the enrichment of others, and that we might draw strength from one another, not forgetting that all of us live in thy world, responsible to thee, with thy strength and power available to us. Amen. I've been asked to make this announcement. Miss Verla Seaton of Worthington State Junior College is asked to report to the registration desk in the union. Miss Verla Seaton. Dr. Albert Swanson, acting president of the college, has asked me to whenever it seemed appropriate to indicate that his absence from the conference is the result of another commitment in behalf of the institution at a session of the presidents of the Central States College Association in Detroit. There are quite a few people in these parts, including a number at Gustavus Adolphus College who remember Abraham Kaplan as a debater at St. Thomas College, an adversary to be reckoned with on the debate platform, a national champion of 1936. In those years, I think Gustavus and St. Thomas shared somewhat more than its share of national championships. Those who were involved with Gustavus debate activities in those years were relieved to have him graduate and to be through with him. But he went on to the University of Chicago and UCLA for a doctorate in philosophy and then to a distinguished teaching career, beginning at New York University, then 10 years at UCLA, then eight years at Brandeis, and since 1963 at the University of Michigan. In addition, he's had a list of visiting professor appointments at Harvard, Columbia, and a number of other institutions in this country and elsewhere, which lead one to conclude that a good many more places have wanted him than could get him. He's the author of at least four books and an almost unlimited number of articles in scholarly journals. And he tells me that this morning that in addition to these volumes, he and his wife have just completed a new translation of uh, the books of the Pentateuch in the Old Testament and is proceeding for, to, with further translations of the Bible. He has caught the attention of the journalistic world. One News Weekly says he has been fascinating crowded classrooms of students with deft expositions of ethics, aesthetics, epistemology, and other facets of philosophy, interlacing the complex parts of his rapidly delivered lectures with liberal doses of philosophical whimsy, Kaplan, Kaplan is a classroom spellbinder. Another weekly put him on its front page along with 19 other top teachers in America. He's a profound student of the religions of the world and is aware of the religious dimension of human existence. It's appropriate that he should remind us that human language implies dialogue and that dialogue has implications for life. Professor Kaplan will speak now on the life of dialogue. Dr. Kaplan. 
reminded of my youth in the world of debate very much tempts me to begin, Mr. Chairman, worthy opponents, honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen. It has a sweet old-fashioned ring, doesn't it? The people we talk to nowadays are so seldom regarded as being worthy and honorable. And yet, I suppose it is true, after all, that it is impossible to go home again. And being back here in Minnesota, and especially listening to the papers yesterday, I recall that my undergraduate days were occupied with science. I took my degree in chemistry. And I envied my fellow panelists their opportunity for scientific objectivity. And I have moved increasingly through the years away from the objectivity of science to what now, I must say, is a frankly subjective point of view. So that although my topic is formally communication, and although I will be referring quite often to the ideas of Martin Buber, the contemporary philosopher and theologian who taught for many years at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem until his death just a few years ago. In fact, I will not be talking about these objective matters, but about something quite subjective. Great French writer and critic Anatole Franz, in commenting on the inevitable subjectivity of literary criticism, said that if a man were really honest, a critic, he would say to his audiences something like this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you about myself on the subject of Shakespeare. So let me say that I'm going to talk to you about myself on the subject of communication. Maybe a little more broadly, not only about myself, but also about you, about this concrete human situation just at this moment and in this place. Yesterday, we talked about a great many fascinating people. We heard not only about the birds and the bees and frustrated tree crickets and frightened chimpanzees, but about autistic children and abandoned children and illegitimate children, people who were sensorily deprived and culturally deprived, and then in the evening, pygmies and Watusis, Yankees and Red Sox. But we did not address ourselves concretely and specifically to the people that we are here and now. And it seems to me that this was not an incidental feature of the scientific approach to language and communication, but is quite characteristic of the part that is played by these ideas in contemporary philosophy, at least in the English-speaking world. In philosophy, there has been an interesting movement in the conceptualization of the problems of this field, a movement which 
As so often is true of philosophy, alas, is just in the reverse direction of what has been happening in linguistics and related scientific disciplines. Philosophy, some three or four decades ago, was extremely structural in its approach, extremely formal, and gradually moved from considerations of logical syntax to the field of semantics, and now in recent times has been occupied with the uses and functions of language. At just a time in which, as Chomsky pointed out to us last night, the linguist abstracts from the uses of language or the conditions of the use of language and focuses on structural descriptions. Now, I believe that there is another step that is yet to be taken, not as an alternative by any means to the formal, abstract, or structural approach, but as what Chomsky himself emphasized, a very much needed supplementation if we are going to interest ourselves in certain human needs which communication serves. And that step is to look not at the medium which makes communication possible, nor even to the conditions, whether neurological or environmental or whatever they may be that make communication possible, but to look at the human beings who are communicating with one another and to ask oneself what happens to people when they communicate. Now, I want to approach this question in terms of a basic category of Martin Buber's thinking concerning two modalities of human relationship, no doubt familiar to many of you, one called the I-thou modality, the other the I-it modality. And very roughly speaking, one in which both we and the other accept ourselves as the human beings that we are, while in the second modality we dehumanize, depersonalize the other, and in the process also dehumanize, depersonalize ourselves. Most philosophy today is carried out in the I-it modality. There's even a, a curious idiom that we have taken over from Britain. People talk of doing philosophy as though there is some process to which certain impersonal materials are subjected, to what end, serving what values, expressing what human needs, is very hard to say. And how different this is from the approach to philosophy, say, of a Socrates, or for that matter, of an Isaiah, come let us reason together. Most philosophy today, however, Buber has said, is carried out as monologue. The philosopher isn't talking to anyone. He's not even talking to his colleagues. He may be talking for them, 
He wants them to see what he is saying, but it is not a genuine saying. There is no one at the other end. Or at any rate, there is something not wholly human in that kind of communication situation. And this style of our philosophizing, and as I proceed, I shall want to suggest that it is a style to be found throughout our culture, is also associated with certain conceptions of the very nature of language and of communication. First, the philosopher does something in his own particular, peculiar way, and then he reads out his personal peculiarities into the cosmos. He uses language in a certain way, and then concludes that this is of the very nature of language. What has happened here is that the ideal of language, especially for the philosophical analyst, has been more and more one in which language is dehumanized and depersonalized. He looks to scientific discourse and especially to scientific discourse in its most mathematical forms. And to do the scientist justice, I think we would have to say it's not really scientific discourse that the philosopher is looking at, but his own picture, and a distorted one it usually is, of what scientific discourse is like until finally he holds up to us the paradigm of a language that we can use to communicate with machines. Now I'd like to make something quite clear at the outset. I am a warm admirer and warmly appreciate technology and especially the things that have already been achieved and the great promise that I see for the future in the application of a variety of new technologies to the tasks of education. I think we have scarcely begun to exploit the potentialities of the teaching machine and the various other such devices. I think Chomsky was a thousand times right when he warned us last night that there is a great danger in this development as well. Namely, that we let the technology determine the values rather than proceeding the other way around. I've sometimes thought about the matter in this way that maybe somebody should start devoting some effort to the design and construction of learning machines. Because in the great mass universities of the future, I foresee a possibility of great lecture halls with a teaching machine on one end and a whole bank of learning machines at the other end in a closed circuit. <coughs> And somewhere in another small room, a few human beings can sit around and talk and participate in the educational process. <laughs> because there are two quite different sorts of things that can go on in the schooling situation. Both types of communication, I suppose. One I call instruction which is the transmission of information and certain skills, both in the processing of that information and in handling other materials. But there is another process for which I reserve the term education, quite different from instruction, which is a process of human growth. And that can take place only when human beings are fully in interaction with one another. 
I believe instruction can be carried out by machine and probably better than it can be done by humans. And I believe that whatever can be done by machine should be done by machine. So as to leave the human being free to devote himself to what is most distinctively human in his capacities. Now there is a danger in this point of view also, and I am anxious not to be misunderstood. There is a danger that the insistence on the human values that technology is to serve may become an excuse, a defense, a justification for the expression of hostility to the whole scientific enterprise opposition to the intellect, to reason, to the human mind. There's a danger of obscurantism in this point of view, and I want to dissociate myself from that as strongly as I can. I don't believe in the two cultures of C.P. Snow, of science on the one side and, and the humanities on the other. Science is itself one of the greatest, the most distinctively human of man's achievements. Buber is anxious to make the point in this way that in differentiating these modalities of the thou and the it, he is not condemning the domain of the it or the I-it modality. He says on the contrary, you cannot hold on to life without it. Its reliability sustains you, but should you die in it, your grave would be in nothingness. Or most simply, without it, man cannot live, but with it alone, he is not a man. I want to look at communication then, not in terms of it alone, but precisely in terms of the ways in which it can bring human beings together as human or hold them apart, or at any rate bring them together not as human, but as depersonalized objects to one another. And I believe that a very great deal of communication in modern society is of this second kind. There's an enormous amount of talk in our society. An enormous amount of communication, I suppose, written as well as spoken. But really, in another sense, there is very little communication. There is very little that is actually being said to one another. It may be that, as Augustine put it yesterday, the mind is the last sanctuary of individuality and integrity. But I begin to wonder if even that is a sanctuary, because it is constantly and apparently increasingly being invaded by communications that say nothing to us, that mean nothing to us, but that nevertheless take hold of us, compel our attention and our memories, and make it even harder than surely it is already to see clearly ourselves or other people or the world around us. We are apparently coming increasingly in our culture to have a horror of silence. And wherever you go nowadays, someone is dinning something into your ears, whether it's in a market or 
in an elevator or in the airplane or at a restaurant or wherever it might be, or a schoolroom for that matter. If it isn't talk, then it's somebody's notion of music or some other way to, to fill the perceptual. Is it this same horror of being sensorily deprived of which we were told yesterday, I wonder? I wonder because I find that in our culture at the same time, we have the most fantastic exaggerated conception of what can be accomplished by talk, both for good and for ill. We think that if only the right things are said, somehow all will be well, and we are probably the greatest masters of the euphemism that the world has ever known. And we fear also that if the wrong things are said, the foundations of society will totter. I confess I have never been able to understand why in so many communities there is so much anxiety about the kinds of speakers that are invited to a campus. The man comes and however outrageous his views are, he talks for an hour or two and goes his way. But I talk to the students day after day and week after week and month after month, and then at the end of the semester I read the final exams and I see I've had no effect whatsoever. <laughs> Charlie Brown once calls Lucy some name and she says to him, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, you blockhead. So we worry about the violence on television screens, but we are not so much worried apparently about the violence in the real world around us, whether in our own cities or in Vietnam or the Middle East. We want to protect the children from the symbol rather than from the reality, because the symbol comes to be more real to us than the reality itself. I suppose now there is a whole generation for whom the cosmos and space has taken on a reality because they've seen it on TV. And that is the final authentication in our time. We pay an enormous price for this belief in magic. Magic always extorts an enormous price, or more accurately, it is reality that takes its revenge on us for closing our eyes to it. One of the prices that we pay, I believe, is what is variously called alienation, a crisis of identity, and I don't know what all else. I believe that part of the reason, a part only, but a significant part of the reason for the rise of the demonstration as a social phenomenon, whether on campuses or on city streets, is connected just with this, that somebody is saying, look at me as a human being, listen to me, and talk to me, not at me. Let us establish a genuine communication, and this is what I am demanding above all else. Yet, in so many institutions, not just in education, but so pervasively in our society,
this deep need, which we all know ourselves and feel deeply, is apparently more and more being denied. Aristotle wrote a treatise on ethics. Two chapters in that treatise were devoted to the subject of friendship. Among other things, Aristotle says, even if a man had all other goods, if he had no friends, life would not be worth living. I doubt if a single book on ethics written in English in the 20th century so much as contains the word friendship in the index. Well, maybe it is in the index and it's probably there as an example of an abstract noun. <laughs> because so far as our general social patterns are concerned, we don't have friends. We have contacts or connections or clients or customers or constituents. Why they all begin with C, Chomsky might explain. <laughs> <laughs> and we even formulate some of our technological aims in just these terms. Augenstein spoke yesterday of human engineering. And there are some real and important problems that are dealt with there, and I don't for one moment want to derogate their importance. But I also want to call attention to how simply and easily, I almost said naturally, but I think it is quite unnatural, how easy it is for us to look at the human being as a material to be shaped in certain ways, or as an instrumentality to be used in certain ways, rather than as human. Real life, Martin Buber once said, is meeting. Real life is a certain kind of relationship in which the humanity of the parties to the relationship is absolutely central. Now what bearing does that have on the communication process? Let me put it in this way. There is a certain kind of communication which we all know it's infinitely precious to each of us. It's quite different from the sorts of communication that are most common and that are most commonly analyzed. We, I don't care if we give it a separate label. Indeed, I would like to propose a separate label for it. Let me call it communion instead of communication. I'll give you some examples. In the usual type of communication, the model that has been built up and an enormously powerful and valuable model for many, many purposes, let me insist on that, is roughly as follows. There is a source of possible messages which can be conceived as the result of certain choices that are made among a set of alternatives that might be selected for transmission. These choices are then made with certain linking probabilities, not altogether independent of one another. And then the materials are suitably encoded, fed into a channel where they are transmitted to a receiver, distorted in certain respects by the noise in the channels, 
They are then decoded more or less accurately. And finally, someone takes the decoded message and goes his way. Now notice in this process that the human beings appear only at the remote termini. And that everything else of interest takes place in between. But in what I am calling communion, the relationship is a direct one. It is unmediated. It is as though the human beings are put directly into contact with one another. In fact, we use such idioms, don't we? We say, keep in touch with me. And although in a strict sense there are, of course, many mediating processes, somehow they don't have the significance in communion that they do in communication. I mean, what happens when you are experiencing grief and a friend comes and just puts his arm around you? Charlie Brown asks somewhere, whatever happened to good old-fashioned arms around the shoulder sympathy, which he never gets. No words are exchanged and they aren't needed, but there is something important that relates the two people in that situation. Or you look at someone whom you know or whom you would like to know and your eyes meet and the eyes are the window of the soul as are the hands, the lips, everything with which we can communicate. But here, it isn't as though there is something that lies between, but as though two human beings have, for those brief moments, become just one. In fact, eye contact is really a very intimate relationship. And were you to catch the eye of a stranger and persist, in our culture at least, either the contact would be broken very quickly, or the relationship would move to a new plane, whether of hostility or something quite other. I don't know. But it would not remain just on that. You're never the same again after what has passed between you. And yet it isn't so much that something passed between you, but that in that moment you were truly with one another as human beings. I might say this. There are many human relationships which manifest a kind of reciprocity. I do something for you, you do something for me. Indeed, quite often it would be more accurate to say, I do something to you, and then in return I allow you to do something to me. But this is a very different kind of relationship than a mutual relationship in which we do something together that neither of us can do separately and that does not involve our depersonalizing the other but exactly the contrary that allows each party in this process to be even more fully human. There is a difference, after all, is there not, between talking with someone and talking to them, or in that suggestive idiom, talking at them. 
There is a kind of communication distinct from both monologue and dialogue, for which I suggest the term duologue. In duologue, there are two people talking, but they are not talking with one another. Duologue is not communion in the present sense. It is a kind of communication, if you like. There is information which is being transmitted, but not to human beings. Or at any rate, there are not two human beings at the same time. The mark of duologue is this, that the two people are not really brought together in mutuality. They are at best only in a reciprocal relationship. When one person is talking, the other one is not listening. He is only thinking of what he will say when it's his turn to talk. The cocktail party is the institutionalization of duologue. And so, I am afraid, is the classroom. First, the professor talks and the students don't listen. <laughs> then the students talk or write and the professor doesn't listen or read. Or at any rate, they are not human beings talking with one another in this situation, but each of them is doing something to the other and makes the claim to justify it on the ground that he is really doing something for the other, although it is never quite clear who is doing it for whom. What is most characteristic of mutuality, of communion, is that feature of language that Marler called openness, or that Chomsky described as being creative, or as governed by a transformational generative grammar, something of the kind, that I would put in a layman's terms in this way, that when people are in communion, or when they are in this narrow sense really communicating with one another, the content of what is being communicated does not exist prior to and independently of that particular context. There is no message, except in a post hoc reconstruction, that is present fixed and complete beforehand. If I am really talking with you, I have nothing to say, but what I say arises as you and I genuinely relate to one another. I don't know beforehand what it will be. I don't know beforehand who I will be, because I am open to you just as you are open to me. And this, I think, is what makes growth possible among human beings. And why really it seems to me impossible to teach unless you are learning why you cannot really talk unless you are listening. And you are listening not only to the other, you are listening to yourself and indeed in a fundamental way. I would even say in quite a literal way, self and other are now so intertwined that we need new conceptual frameworks new categories, I think, to describe what is really happening here. Chomsky said last night in his view of language, the study of language is a branch of 
theoretical psychology, and that seems to me to be very, very much in the right direction. But I should want also to say it must be a social psychology, or perhaps we should just say it is really a branch of theoretical sociology. Marler put it, a certain kind of social structure or a certain pattern of involvement of several organisms is essential in the development of communication. Now, Buber puts the point in this way. He says that we become human beings only insofar as we enter into this relationship with human beings. Through the thou, a man becomes an I. I caught something very like this in the invocation that Dr. Carlson delivered yesterday morning. We need each other to become ourselves. We need talk, not merely to fill a sensory vacuum, but to fill what would otherwise be a far more intolerable void within ourselves where otherwise we seek for an identity. Just as there is a difference between communion and communication, between an I-it and an I-thou relationship. There is a corresponding difference between a self that becomes truly human and a self that is only an object among other objects, an it in the domain of the it. It is the difference between an identity and an identification. We all have plenty of identifications. They're not only easy to come by, they're impossible to avoid. Everywhere you turn around, you're given another one with another number. But the identity is something quite other. It is not what allows us to be located in the domain. It's what makes us, we feel, the particular persons that we are. I believe that this breakdown of communication, or perhaps more accurately, the failure to achieve it, I don't know that we ever have had it, I don't believe in the myth of a golden age, but I believe that this failure truly to communicate with one another is very much bound up with not only the individual search for identity which has been a task for the young ever since there were young but I believe it is also bound up with great social problems both on the domestic and the foreign scene because many people increasingly seem to be coping with this problem by way of negative identities, thinking to find themselves precisely by differentiating themselves from the other, not by being with the other, but, if I may turn the preposition, by being against the other. Racism of both the black and the white varieties, I think, have this psychodynamic. I can't talk with you. Indeed, I won't talk with you. For only in that refusal will I find myself, I think. 
in the rabbinic tradition, there's a beautiful aphorism which runs, if I am I only because you are you, and you are you only because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. For we then face one another only as two mirrors endlessly reflecting their emptiness into one another. I'm sure if you heard it yesterday, the line of Augustine's is still with you, a deeply moving line. Little George, it is important to me that you are who you are. And that is perhaps the greatest thing that any human being can say to any other human being. It is important to me that you are who you are. And that I am who I am. And you and I together can communicate and thereby more fully realize all the potentialities for the human that lie within us. Well, some such ideas uh, have quite a history in modern times. The sociologist and philosopher George Herbert Mead is especially associated with the notion of the intimate relationship between the development of the self and the use of what he called significant symbols. But in me, this fundamental dialogue with the generalized other is something that takes place within the self. And most important, with me and related ideas, the self is analyzed as though it comes to be once for all. We pay a lot of attention to the infant at just the stage at which it is learning to talk. And then we imagine once it has learned how to talk, it has acquired a self and the rest is no longer of particular concern to us. We leave off, it seems to me, at precisely the point where we should begin. The self comes to be in every dialogue. It is generated in every act of communication. I am other than I was only because of what now I am saying to you. And if I am really saying it to you, if you are with me in this act of communication, you also are now in quite a strict sense other than you previously were. Now, people can be together in various senses of that term without really being with one another, just as they can talk without communicating. Buber calls this kind of togetherness a collectivity, and he contrasts it with a community. A community is an aggregation in which there is a binding of human beings to one another. In a collectivity, he says, there is no binding together, just bundling together. We use one another in the collectivity. We may say we, but it is a kind of group egotism. And it has no genuine content any more than the word I has a genuine content when the man who speaks it has no identity and truly does not know who he is. And it may be he has not yet become an I. And so also in our social aggregations, we too often have not become community. 
I think many people who talk about the problems of our cities are victims again of a kind of myth of the golden age. The breakdown of the community as though somewhere in the past people really were together as human and we have lost all this and usually it is blamed on technology or science or numbers or something modern. All that I think is a myth or at any rate uh, it is for me a myth I dissociate myself from it. But I think it is true that a great deal of our lives are spent when we are with other people in collectivities and not in communities. Recently someone proposed I think a really brilliant measure of the degree of civilization of any society. A numerical measure. He said it is given by this by the number of strangers whom you can trust. Or, as I would prefer to say in this context, by the number of strangers that you can talk to, that you can talk with, that you can understand and know also that you are understood by them. And that, of course, is another way of saying that you enter into community with them. It is one of the features of our time, I am afraid, that we can talk with strangers only in times of disaster. Last night when we were snowbound, or thought we might be, I confess, hoped we might be. There was a little bit of electricity in the air, so it seemed to me a little movement away from the I-it to the I-thou. A little softening, a little humanizing of one another. And this has been observed, for instance, in the power blackout in New York or in an earlier time during the Blitz in London. And what a pass we have come to if we can allow ourselves, our humanity, only in those moments in which there is some chance that we will pay for it with our lives. And instead we do pay for it with our lives the rest of the time or with the kinds of lives that we lead, what Thoreau called those lives of quiet desperation. Or maybe in our time they aren't quite so quiet, but they're just as desperate. Unless we talk with one another, we deny ourselves our humanity in the very moment also in which we turn aside from the humanity of the other. There are some profoundly moral and religious implications in all this, which of course Buber made explicit. No doubt many of you have already been drawing, drawing out for yourselves. One might distinguish between two kinds of evil in human experience. One in which the it predominates in our lives. Not that the it itself is evil but that the domination of the it is evil. And we might put it in this way. It is the kind of evil in which we do not communicate with others, we only manipulate others. We keep them in the domain of the it. There's a principle of 
Kantian morality, for that matter, to be found in many versions in Christianity and Judaism, others of the world's religions. It is the evil that consists in treating other human beings only as means to ends and not experiencing them, each other human individual, as an end in himself. But there's a second kind of evil, uh, much harder to see, intimately bound up with the first. That is one in which we talk all right, but we talk only to ourselves. It is the evil not of living only in the domain of the it, but the evil that consists in mistaking I for thou. We worship, but we worship only idols of our own making. And become, as the psalmist rightly pointed out, become like the idols that we have made. The central, a central problem, at any rate, of religious thought can be formulated as a problem in the field of communication. It is the cry, why art thou silent? Why does not God give me a sign? How shall I reach him? And why does he turn away from me? Quite extraordinary, is it not? how these same locutions expressing very similar feelings might be applied to our sense of alienation from other human beings. If only we can establish a communication, we are asking. Every thou in Martin Buber's idiom, every thou is a glimpse of the eternal thou. The religious experience is a, an intensification of the experience that we have in every encounter in which we are truly with the other and experience the other as thou. And in that case, Uber, I think, quite rightly concludes that God talks to man all the time. He talks to man in all of the things and all of the beings that he sends to man. And man answers in all of his dealings with these things and beings. And we can answer in two different ways. It's again that same duality, the same contrast that I've been drawing on all morning. Uber finds these two symbolized in the two scriptural characters of Adam and Abraham. God calls to Adam, where art thou? And Adam ran and hid himself. But God said, Abraham, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. Thereby instituting the dialogue which establishes the biblical religion.
There are some very popular words today, cliches in fact, just used one, encounter, confrontation, and even, I will be the first to admit it, dialogue. These three words have a very interesting property. You can take the three of them in any order and you will sound as though you are really with it. We have entered upon this confrontation so as to make possible a dialogue that will lead to genuinely human encounters. <laughs> or we have entered upon this dialogue so that the encounter will... You can ring the changes. But I believe that these words have become cliches because what they are pointing to in however vague and confused a way is something universal and universally important to us. And I want to conclude by injecting one other element into an already almost hopelessly complicated and confused situation. And that is this. That the aim of all communication, it seems to me, is to arrive at communion, or to put it more boldly, the aim of all talk is only to pave the way for silence. We move in all talk from silence to silence. Only there are two very different kinds. There's the silence of hostility, of ignorance, of bewilderment, the silence which means I have nothing to say to you nor you to me. And there is that very different silence of understanding, of love, of knowledge, where it is not that we have nothing to say to each other but that nothing more needs to be said. What we really need, I think, I would invite my scientific colleagues to look at this problem, is a syntax of silence. We might do well to focus on the ways in which human beings communicate when they are not using language or its conventional equivalents in gesture and the like. A psychiatrist friend of mine in Los Angeles told me once of the following experience that he had had. Late one night he was at the Los Angeles General Hospital and had occasion to go to the surgical waiting room. There was only one person there, a woman who was just sobbing as though her heart would break. And he asked the nurse on duty, who it was, and she said, that's Mrs. Gonzalez. Her husband has just died on the operating table. Oh, he said, I know the case. And he went over and sat down by her, and he said, Mrs. Gonzalez, it happens that I'm Dr. Ingham, and I knew about your husband's case, and he had a tumor of such and such a kind, and he had the best care. I know the surgeon, and he would have died uh, very shortly. And, and he talked on, and as he talked, her, her crying, subsided a little bit and was replaced by a few whimpers and then she really quieted down and even was able to smile a little through her tears and held his hand very warmly and, and smiled at him and he sat and talked with her for some time and then looked at his watch and realized he had to leave and got up and as he was walking out the nurse on duty called him over and said, Dr. Ingham, I didn't know that you spoke Spanish. He said, Spanish? I don't know any Spanish. He said, well, then what were you talking about with Mrs. Gonzalez? She doesn't know a word of English. <laughs> and that really was 
talk. That really was communication, was it not? I think in our schools, at any rate, there is altogether too little silence. Everybody in the school situation seems to panic at the thought that maybe somebody would be sitting there without talking or listening to talk or maybe without reading or writing. We have the students carefully read Walt Whitman and they may even analyze and parse the lines about loafing and inviting your soul. But you aren't allowed to do it. If you're on the faculty, it's because you have a committee meeting. <laughs> and if you're in the student body, it's because you have an assignment and a, a, a paper to write. It may be that not only in our schools, but throughout our society, if we talked less, we might say more. If we didn't try so hard to communicate, we might be able to commune. If we did not search so hard for our own identities, but occupied ourselves with the other, we may find precisely what we were not seeking. If we listen, it may be that we will find it at last possible to respond here I am. I think you have gathered from the response that you have indeed established a community here this morning and that we are happy to be eyes to, to your vow or the reverse. Those of you who must leave may do so now. You are invited to write your questions that you wish to have Dr. Kaplan, respond to on the cards that have been given you, pass them to the aisle, and then they will be brought forward by the ushers. The next session of the conference is at 1.30 this afternoon in Alumni Hall. Then the panel at 3.30 and the closing dinner this evening. Now we'll ask Dr. Kaplan to respond to some of the questions that have come in. Would you comment on the need for persons to become aware of and develop the use of nonverbal expressions for more meaningful intra and interpersonal relationships? I think man has an unlimited capacity for perversion. We can turn everything to an evil purpose or misuse every instrumentality. It's perfectly true that in many of the examples of which I was speaking of real communication, or communion as I put it, I turn to the nonverbal. But the nonverbal can also become only a device for not being with others, but on the contrary, for holding them apart. <laughs> 
I mean, for example, the falsely hearty handshake, or my favorite example, the what I call the stewardess syndrome. See that, that sweet <laughs> smile. <laughs> I, I recently lectured at UCLA, in fact, on loneliness and discussed the stewardess syndrome at some length. And after the lecture, among the people that came was one very attractive young woman that looked vaguely familiar to me, and I honestly expressed it, and she said, oh, don't you, I was the stewardess on your flight, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think that nonverbal methods of communication can be very much more fully used, but I think it would only shift the problem to a new locus. Let me also make clear in the other direction, I most certainly did not mean to imply that words always keep people apart. They can also serve to bring them together. Is violence objectionable on television because it is believed there or is it objectionable because it is enjoyed there? I should find both of those objectionable. But uh, there's something else that can be done with symbols. The symbol is different from reality, and that's not only a defect, it is also the basis for all of the important values that the symbol provides. And specifically with regard to violence, I'm really not this much of an Aristotelian, but he keeps coming to my mind this morning. There is something else that the symbols of violence can do other than inducing belief or enjoyment. They can purge us of pity and fear, to use the phrase from Aristotle's poetics. They can provide a catharsis. And I would want to say that in these terms, precisely that is being achieved in, in great works of art. There's a fantastic amount of violence in the Greek tragedies, in the Shakespearean tragedy. The stage is covered with blood, but there is a great difference. What I object to in television is not the violence, but the lack of art. The, well, I once encountered the following statistic. I think something over 80% of American homes have a television set in them, but only one out of 20 has a garbage disposal. There, I think, is the difficulty. <laughs> to what would you attribute this withholding of self? Is it simply a lack of mutual trust? would have been easier to answer the question if the word simply were not there. I would say that if one had to answer in brief, we probably could not do better than with the one word, fear. Fear that operates on several different levels. Fear of rejection, but also fear of acceptance, which will then betray our inadequacy. And maybe a fear also of being accepted and being adequate, but then finding yourself committed. That's also something to fear. And maybe a fear for the very integrity of the self. If I open myself to you, I may be swallowed. And if I give myself to you, there may be nothing left of me. There is, I think, a very basic dilemma of identity which runs as follows, that we need the other for identity, but the other is always a threat to my identity. The dilemma might be put in this way. How can I be what I am 
without fear of being different from, other than you? And how can I be with you without fear of losing my identity? I don't think that these dilemmas have solutions. I think we only learn to cope with them and go on to the next. Ah. I was anticipated. The next card reads, it seems that frequently people do not communicate because they are afraid. What about fear as an inhibitor of dialogue? Which particular characteristics are reserved for man and denied the machine? That is, is there any activity which is solely human that the machine cannot or will not do? I must speak only from ignorance, but it seems to me that in any sense that is really useful of the term machine, there are no intrinsic or principled limitations. But uh, we're not concerned here, I would imagine, with matters of principle or with what philosophers like to call the last analysis. We have enough trouble with the penultimate analysis. We should look rather at the characteristics of the machines actually in operation or that will be in operation in the foreseeable future. And then we know very well what the differences are. And yet, I think that our turning to the machine as the locus in relation to which we can formulate these differences is a way of turning aside from ourselves as a locus. Instead of asking what human qualities does a machine or might a machine have, I suggest instead the question, in what ways does the human being behave as though he is no longer human or as though he is merely a mechanical contrivance? That is a very real question and I think it can be given only too extensive an answer. How does your concept of communion relate to the current techniques and purposes of sensitivity training, if at all? I think it has a very close relationship, at least in, in my own mind. But I think that from a number of very different directions today, we are converging upon a related body of ideas. Uh, some have come from uh, metaphysics, uh, especially of an existentialist kind. Some uh, from religion, uh, some from psychotherapy, some from uh, enterprises like sensitivity training, which in turn grew out of, uh, of uh, management and uh, executive training uh, programs. Uh, from a variety of different directions, I think we are turning more and more to a focus on the whole human being and asking ourselves in what ways the patterns and institutions of our society or of individual behavior sustain and enhance this whole humanity and in what ways they constrict and interfere with it. So I would not wish to associate the ideas that I put forward with uh, any particular set of ideas from any direction, but would uh, welcome contributions from a variety of them. And in my own case, I think uh, sensitivity training or encounter groups uh, have played a significant uh, part. Is it possible to establish communion between two people with absolutely opposing ideas? I suppose I'm going to 
be answering in terms of faith rather than evidence. But it does seem to me that unless we can establish communion in these cases, we're not going to have communion at all. It's easy to talk with people you love. The trick is to be able to talk with people you don't love. And maybe even more, we must learn to live in a world of hate. Only I should like to say this. That ideas can differ from one another without opposing one another. I am, in spite of Augustine, maybe we'll have to thrash it out in the panel, I am a relativist, but I believe that values are objective. Only they can be objective and at the same time plural. And I think there is too great a tendency for us to suppose that all values can be linearly ordered, that there is a, a single dimension of value, so that if you take any two different points, one must be better and the other must be worse. And it's curious, we recognize that this is not so in the arts, and it makes no sense to ask whether Keats was a better poet than Chopin was a composer, I mean, that's, that's just idle talk. What we want to do is to appreciate the poetry and appreciate the music, and there are many different kinds of poetry even, and for that matter, many different qualities even of sonnet and such like. In the house of our Lord, there are indeed many mansions. But we can absolutely oppose when we close ourselves off from the other. And I suppose my thesis has been that when we do that, we are closing ourselves off from ourselves as well. I, I think that in principle I would have to say that if two people are absolute in their opposition, they have each abandoned their humanity. It is not possible for human beings absolutely to oppose one another. I suppose it could be put in another way that loving is intrinsic to our natures. Or that if you prefer political to religious idioms, as soon as we see them as no longer human, we find ourselves increasingly involved in inhumanities. I would say, therefore, that it is possible and it can be done just in so far as we abandon our absoluteness and are prepared really to talk with the other. I think of a concrete political case that is very meaningful to me. The problems today in the Middle East, which can be regarded as in a significant degree problems of instituting dialogue, of really talking with one another. There is an apocryphal story, it's so good, I, I hope it has some truth in it that some American undersecretary recently remarked in the United Nations, why can't Israel and her Arab neighbors settle their differences like Christian gentlemen? <laughs> and I do believe that a, an Asian Buddhist who overheard it remarked the trouble is that that's just what they're doing. <laughs> What is the significance of today's college community? Is there indeed a search for community, or is today's search one for escape?
Well, of course, it's a search for community. But the impulse to escape is always present. It's what Freud called the death wish. It's the impulse in all of us to turn away from a real world that presents problems that sometimes seem overwhelming and replace it by a fantasy world of our own making where we can solve problems without effort. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a hell of heaven a heaven of hell. So we turn away, and I see a good deal of this turning away. I think that's the significance of uh, the drug in our time of a variety of types. And there are other escape mechanisms operative. But I don't think anything is gained by closing the door for escape or by putting heavier shackles on the prisoner. We try to escape from a reality when we find the reality painful and feel ourselves to be powerful to do anything with it. And I think what we need to do is to address ourselves to the circumstances that are producing the pain and that are also involved in the feeling of powerlessness. This seems to me to be as true with regard to the problems of the ghetto as it is with regard to the problems of student unrest, as it is indeed with regard to the problems of war and peace on the world scene. Of course the reality is painful and of course our powers are limited and of course the problems are almost unmanageable. But there is a world of salvation in the word almost. At any rate, there is a world of hope in that almost and perhaps that is almost all that a man can ask for. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Those of you whose questions may not have been answered at this time, uh, Dr. Kaplan will review the questions before the panel, and you may find them reflected in his comments then. Thank you.